So chances are you probably don't remember that for many, many years I've done uh, what I've called an exhaustive study. And this evolved from uh, different websites that I took part in where basically I wanted to get into a subgenre or I wanted to delve deeper into a subgenre. So I basically sat down, made a list of every single release within that subgenre in chronological order and listened to all of it, making remarks and taking notes as I went so I could discern exactly what was it that made, uh, at first it was uh, technical thrash metal. I wanted to know what made what was the difference between progressive thrash metal, technical thrash metal, and standard thrash metal, and, and other types, and how that translated, when it translated, who had the first ideas, and who was influenced by them, who was a, a hanger-on, who took that idea and made something new out of it. And so when in approach of melodic black metal, the real thing to contest with was that a lot of people called melodic black metal symphonic black metal. The, the, the two things weren't, uh, they're not the same thing as far as I was concerned. And because I love bands like Dissection and uh, Sacramentum and Dawn and uh, even things beyond that, uh, the, that Swedish sort of pocket of interest. And I wanted to see uh, what defined something as melodic black metal then, what was a lasting feature that people continue to view, and how these definitions have changed and evolved as more correct definitions or less correct definitions have evolved in the mouths and minds of people who talk about music um, all the time. There are so many talking heads out there in terms of uh, retro music that... I wanted to do something different in terms of you don't need a video essay telling you what was when I didn't experience it. Rather, this is the information that I have that tells me these things about melodic black metal. So the spirit of an exhaustive study is not performative. It is meant to get people to participate in the historic understanding of where these subcultures formed and where their viability introduced itself and when it ran out. And so I found that in my first pass back in 2017 through 2018, from 1991 until about 2005, we really see the full extension of the melodic black death metal idea that first sprang up exhausted. And there have been releases since then, but in our first exploration, we're going to take a slower walk through this so that we can really savor the introduction of these ideas and appreciate the chronological order in which they produced. We get closer to some of the dates of, of release. We get closer to the formative demo tapes. And we take a look at items that are maybe don't seem related at all, but really help to form or um, give us an idea of what, what and why things were related melodic compared to what was around at the time. So I think for this to make sense, you're going to need an education in two things, first and foremost. You really do need to know what was popular between 1988 uh, in terms of heavy metal underground and above uh, until about 1995 at least. And that's a lot to cover in terms of black metal, a lot to cover in terms of death metal, but you have to understand uh, the state of the industry as it evolved and how both black and death metal became mainstream articles and only briefly for some and, and more for others. But if you don't fundamentally understand uh, the impact of like a band like Morbid Angel or At The Gates, you might be a little bit too entry level to understand um, how those bands influenced others. And that also includes uh, King Diamond and Merciful Fate, um, you know, Dark Throne, anything like that, where if we're going to start talking about um, dissection, you really need to know those bands he was listening to. You need to know that hardcore punk was in a big part and thrash metal and all those things were very important. So if you don't have any understanding of the origins of thrash metal, you haven't watched any documentaries on thrash, you, know, you don't listen to Metallica or any of that, you can still probably figure out what's going on. But if you want to debate or uh, contribute a thought or recommend a band or a demo tape, I would ask that you understand um, or have done a lot of the work to get into uh, the sort of tape trading circles and uh, early releases from this these subgenres as we break into it. 
And uh, we start with 1990, actually, where I do discuss, you know, a lot of trends running through the suburbs of Sweden and especially the southern part of Sweden. Uh, we get uh, a lot of Slayer influence and Necrophobic early on. We get uh, Rotting Christ starting out as a grindcore band influenced by hardcore punk. The Greek scene was full of a lot of eclectic punk and uh, avant-garde music. And there's a history of progressive rock uh, in the country as well. There's a lot of uh, interesting art that was going on in a lot of these countries while they were also going through a lot of um, social change, uh, you know, uh, socioeconomic change and things like that. There's a lot to consider that, you know, Sweden was a different country than Greece was. And so while we're not going to be entirely as studious as that in our with our considerations, but know that the access that uh, dissection had to the world was different than the people in Rotting Christ had. And so insular scenes versus uh, people who could go and do whatever they wanted, you know, there were these were very different types of people creating music that was extreme in different ways. As much as I like to talk about, uh, you know, bands like Morbid, Bathory, Venom, all those are very important. Um, Sorcery's early demo is kind of interesting when we talk about the aesthetics of evil heavy metal and how uh, black metal and death metal uh, introduced itself to Scandinavian and uh, Mediterranean teenagers and, you know, the, the world over to consider otherwise. The important thing is that a lot of this came from the death metal scenes. The death metal scene back then wasn't an exclusive elite thing. It was, from what I understand, you know, obviously I wasn't there, I was a little bit too young, but these were, uh, fa fandom was a different thing back then, and you got your hands on whatever you could, and that included, you know, hardcore punk bands were teenagers, and they'd play with other teenage death metal bands or black metal bands, and they all evolved, made their tapes, made their zines. Everyone was participating on a high level, and they were collaborating. They were sharing ideas. They were doing their best to elevate their own craft, and, you know, it was a very different vibe, and we get that right away. Uh, but we start with Unanimated, a, uh, a sort of a, a Stockholm-based trio who basically known as a death metal band, and I think... Uh, for various reasons, their image early on, and uh, especially their their debut full length, but more importantly, um, they were more of a of a an interesting death metal band to start, and they were, from what I understand, originally mostly influenced by Dismember's early work. Um, I would say, or what I say here is that there were so many amazing death metal bands in Sweden by 1990. When we start talking about like grotesque and merciless and liars in wait and groups like that, where a band like Unanimated were uh, even more devolved than, than uh, the simplicity of a like a band like Grave seems like a technical death metal band next to this tape. But it, what this tape does to start out is to show you that the quick evolution of these bands shows up very soon. Also, it shows that there's quite a lot of camaraderie, a lot of sharing, a lot of tape trading, a lot of things going on here that wasn't uh, opportunistic or plagiarist, as a lot of people sort of seem to feel in hindsight. I'll try to include a clip of these early demo tapes when I can get my hands on a proper recording uh, that I can insert into the video. Give a listen to how primitive this is, and that will give context. <laughs> So the Greek Black Death and Extreme Metal, uh, ex well, Extreme Thrash and Grindcore and Hardcore Punk, uh, all these things fed into each other in that scene. And a band like Deviser was, it was from an enthusiastic fan. I, mean, I think Matt Norris, I think he had his own zine. He'd worked with uh, various other projects. Uh, he had people from all over uh, come in and help him with this EP. There's a lot of uh, big names thanked in its thank you list. You could tell this was someone who was getting his music out there in an enthusiastic way. Um, 
there's a lot of thought put into this tape. Uh, it's even it's got instructions to flip it over so you can view it from the the other side and kind of Voivod esque songs here. There's a member of an old band named Asphyx uh, who put out a, a record, uh, The Spirit of the Dead, back in I think 1989. It was a, just another demo tape. Uh, very interesting start for the uh, Greek black metal scene in some aspects. It's one of the earlier releases where we get. Um, at least some melodic value uh, that isn't thr pure thrash metal. I could include early Verathron releases and uh, some Rotting Christ will show up eventually, but this was my way of connecting a uh, divisor into this uh, sort of conversation, uh, as well as uh, some of the early bands uh, like uh, Septicemia and Horrified, who are still interesting outliers. They do have related members for a lot of bands, and you start to get a sense for the tape trading of the time. You start to get a sense for the, the indeterminate style and the amateurism of a lot of these musicians who were just getting involved. They were they were doing it themselves and uh, this is kind of a cool relic of that time which is uh, you know it's worth listening to if you're not a total snob about you know performances and things like that and the band will say themselves we were just doing uh, whatever came to mind that was the combined creativity of the crew that we put together you know they were having fun making this and um, it does lead this artist down a path where collaboration meant a lot of different results until they came into their own. And so I wanted to show where this band came from because this is where a lot of the creativity that led up to the creation of Melodic Black Metal came from, an enthusiasm, a fandom that uh, is... Uh, we don't necessarily see anymore. We don't see this inclusivity uh, and this um, ambition as often, so much as, as we see uh, specialists and snobs and, and cronies and shit like that. So this was a more pure time for extreme metal where things weren't, were just different the way that I perceived them. So we'll check out uh, a clip from this and uh, just get a sense for just what was happening on this tape and, and uh, the, the vibe of it. So northern Poland-based uh, trio Christ Agony uh, really centers around Cesari uh, and his his uh, his vision for black metal, and which is has always been described as melodic, but not so much on this first record, which was definitely an old school black metal record in terms of its influence taken heavily from Venom and Hellhammer for sure. And we hear that in the riffs. These are very long and involved pieces, which are shaky at best in their rhythms. But we also see some Bathory and some classic heavy metal influence rounding out the experience so that they can fill out these very long pieces. Most of them are about six or seven minutes, and some of them are a little bit melodic. Uh, this is both an important uh, evolution out of the initial sound of Sameo and the, the doom involved with that black metal sound, but also it has its own, um, its own starting point for this band and uh, where they went with it eventually. Uh, now, admittedly, this is maybe one of the first bands that, that I'll introduce that really did... Um, start out with the classics and found their own sound early on but it was definitely uh they took note of what dissection were doing at some point and that introduced something new to their own vernacular and they ran with it on their own and that's they just list dissection as one of their influences but that's a conversation we'll get to on their later releases I think for now, I wanted to show that there were um, some sophisticated acts in this style that are uniformly described as melodic black metal that um, have continued on until, until today in their own unique style, which is different from anything else that I'll, I'll come up with basically here for a while. As we reach into 1991, this is what I would call the advent horizon. This is where uh, we, we start to have to determine, you know, are we going to make the distinction? Is this melody in black metal? What, what are the examples of black metal that didn't have melody? And really, none of that distinction matters. Like I see here, the first enslaved demo 
Well, that had some melody in it, of course. There's at least two songs on there that are certainly melodic. Um, and uh, there were rock influences and other things in there that come from, you know, teenagers learning how to play their instruments in a rehearsal room. So I sort of badmouth some of the uh, elitism of black metal early on for the sake of um, that being a regressive history in itself, that a lot of what the Norwegian specific like death like silence and what them they said this is our thing black metal is ours and it only comes from us and that helped the general zeitgeist of norwegian black metal along with a couple of murders but um black metal was something that existed before and it's certainly something that existed after and uh, i think that as we touch upon a lot more swedish bands we begin to see that a, a lot of these people were not only aligned but uh, put out records on those in those places and had a lot of those same influences well that doesn't really change the conversation from death metal to start because we have the first release from dissection now i don't want to paint uh john not as like a privileged kid but he was certainly a very young kid who had a lot of uh support in uh you know going to school for music and um uh basically having enough friends around him to put together a thrash metal band. Uh, a lot of people have described Rabbit's Carrot as something like Cryptic Slaughter or just a thrash metal-influenced death metal. Um, I don't really care about That's not really important to what this is because that is very primitive and so is the grief prophecy. Uh, this first demo tape is uh, important and formative as kids making death metal that was actually fairly sophisticated for their age. Uh, these are 14-year-old kids. This is nothing compared to like the first grave demo or, or whatever, but it, it is a very early example of death metal um, in this style. And uh, again, you know, Sentenced were doing much more advanced things in 1990. Cadaver had put out a whole album uh, that was just probably mind-blowing at the time. But we also had Carnage's Dark, Recoll uh, Dark Recollections and records like that, which were um, giving death metal it's Scandinavian dues. And so I would say this was just a matter of unbridled enthusiasm, making sure they came up with a result. And uh, there's pitch shifted vocals, there's um, wobbly riffs. Um, but overall, this is sort of a classic introduction to dissection as a death metal band. And uh, of course, everything would change soon enough but you already get a sense for the romanticist and the fandom involved there's there's something more to dissection and we'll see more of that soon enough this was an early in the year release and i think it took them a couple of years to finally get around to putting this thing out so i think they were ready to do something else and they'd already been working on more in the meantime while they were struggling to put out this demo tape uh, as they were kids and you know they were just living their life as it were in the past i've said these were just dumb teenagers making music i want you know i want to make it clear a lot of these legends were dumb teenagers or actually very smart teenagers when they were making this music they weren't 30 year olds with egos on instagram struggling to copy another art you know this was just a kid who was a fan making a cool tape all right, and a bunch of other ones coming along to put it together too, building up that fortitude, building up that talent until they had a breakthrough. And we'll, we'll get there, but first we'll listen to a little bit of this very raw, very ugly death metal demo with a little bit of sophistication around the edges. So for me, the breakthrough of melodic death metal and melodic black metal and their combination really starts with Eucharist. And it starts with this rehearsal in 1991. And listen, they put out a rehearsal song or two back in 1989, or they had it in their, their archives, and that wasn't as good. They put in a couple of years' work before they put together this rehearsal. And it's a fantastic rehearsal. It really brings together the ideas of dual guitar harmonization, uh, contrapuntal rhythmic lines, and distinct phrases seemingly being pulled apart in unison between the two guitarists. We could 
examine where that idea came from. Really, it, it just had to have been Metallica at the time, but we could talk about uh, King Diamond, Abigail, and records like that as well. It doesn't really matter because a lot of these people were rehearsing in the same space. Uh, at the gates and dissection and a lot of them they were they were forming collectives they were they were working together they were observing each other's deals they were putting a ton of effort into what they were doing and these first fruits of eucharist's efforts on this rehearsal really do stamp them as an important band in creating the swedish melodic death metal sound as well as i would say the melodic black death metal sound and i think that those uh, you'll hear echoes of these riffs in the next um, 10 years worth of works. You will hear copies of these riffs, these harmonies, in uh, countless albums that probably sold better than Eucharist's first album. There were a lot of bands that even admitted to copying what Eucharist were doing. And uh, I wouldn't accuse any specific bands. Uh, there are some who've said it outright and others who just said we wanted to meet that same standard. Really, what I would say is this is where there's a craftsmanship to the work of these kids. I think there's a really strong uh, event happening here on this demo where they, they were, they're on the verge of a breakthrough in their material. And maybe other bands might have had that breakthrough a little bit earlier in terms of putting out a product. But this rehearsal showed that there was innovation happening in Eucharist studio and they put it to tape uh, first in a way. So we haven't really had a masterpiece. I, we could argue about Eucharist's demo being just the most brilliant fucking thing uh, to, to come out of Sweden early on uh, that wasn't just morbid angel worship, uh, but that's a reduction in it's a reductive statement in itself. An animated Firestorm is the first proper demo tape that we get in 1991. This was released uh, later in the year. Um, but I don't know the exact date, but... Um, we get uh, this standard that a band like Grotesque was giving at the time. We get a little bit of Eucharist's uh, dual guitar thought. We do get Morbid Angelisms. We get a little bit of Nocturnus on this tape. A lot of these things ended up on their debut full-length album. A lot of the songs here were uh, perfected in that respect. Um, I wouldn't imagine... I would imagine they probably would have heard Necrophobic at this point. Um, but what's interesting about this tape is its uh, atmosphere the introductory song of the call, uh, the storms from the skies of grief, which is very much a Bathory song in its, uh, it's the way that it's written, as well as some of the more uh, death metal songs on here all come together to really embody what was going on at the time, but also give it a more of a black metal spin than anyone else had been doing at the time. And I mean, black metal as a teenager in 1991, Sweden uh, would have seen it. Um, and, as their own and in, in that sense you could we could debate uh, all day what what this is i would say it is one of the first examples of mostly formed melodic black death metal in terms of all of those representations coming together into a single five song demo uh now it's not that's not really an important distinction of who was first um but that this form was evolving in the hands of all these people this is very much a leap from their first demo tape and their rehearsal in 1990. And uh, this is a, a, a much more serious band with a cool logo. And this would be an important band in the melodic black death metal distinction. Um, and we'll see that more as their releases arrive. And uh, yeah, I won't get ahead of myself here. I, I love to talk about an, unanimated all day, but really this tape is, I think, what I would call a masterpiece of a demo. It's like a, a really great showing. It tells you what the, al the album is all about coming up, but also does some things that they weren't sure about that really do feed into this idea of melodic black and death metal forming together into their own thing. So this is the unanimated sound, unedited uh, for 19, until their demo or their first full length would come out. And I think this is uh, uh, probably one of the most important demos to listen to all the way through on your own in terms of understanding where this sound was at and why this was an important band for that sound outside of their albums too. <laughs> Now, 
Nightfall's Vanity is a strange outlier, not only in melodic black metal, uh, but also just in uh, Greek black metal in general, because it is um, Ephthymus Karad Karadimus. Uh, he left his thrash metal band Epidemic uh, back in, uh, I think, 1990. And he there was a story in the liner notes for the reissue of this demo tape onto vinyl and CD that details how he was, he was jumped by the band and robbed after a gig. Um, he was very angry about it. Uh, the, but there was other things to be mad about at the time. Um, the state of Greek politics and culture was changing very drastically. And, uh, he was just an very, very angry young man. And he sort of makes this, melodic black thrash kind of record here with uh, a very accomplished bass uh, performance and uh, thrashing black metal songs. It's one of the earliest examples of Hellenic black metal forming in a way that included keyboards and uh, accomplished bass playing. And um, we could talk about Necromantia. I, you know, I don't know that I would consider them melodic so much as avant-garde at the time. But this is an example where I feel like this is relevant to the conversation because we're going to have to talk about Nightfall at some point um, in terms of uh, melodic black metal and Hellenic black metal. And this starting point is some of their best material. Some of it made it onto the first album. Some of it sounds better in its remastered form than the first album. And uh, overall, I think this is a kind of demo tape where it, it is worth a vinyl release in hindsight it, it's kind of got a really interesting uh touch to it and um, for people who like those old relics that are just kind of weird and have like a weird personality behind them this will just be of interest i don't know how much it really adds to our, our entire story being told here but it helps us build uh this idea that uh, Greek black metal wasn't always um distinctly thought of as melodic black metal in nature and that there were only certain uh, bands that really picked up on their melodic voice. And uh, we can't accuse all um, Greek black metal of being inherently melodic. So I think this is an interesting band to start a lot of those conversations as we move towards, you know, the Rotting Christs and, and whatnot and, and those records. So this is maybe less related to the conversation, but still interesting to it. All right, so speak of the devil here, we have Rod in Christ, and uh, Passage to Arturo, it certainly wasn't their first release. It was their first professional release. I think it is one of their best remembered releases early on, and it is where their, their own personality essentially started to form. Now, that's not to say they'd never played black metal before. Uh, Satanist Tedium is sort of misremembered as a grindcore or a thrash metal record when really it was a black metal demo, and a substantial one at that. I think knowing Satanist Tedium is important to creating contrast with what Passage to Arcturo was doing, which was making more tuneful, mid-paced, and somewhat melodic um, uh, black metal pieces, which were trying to be black metal. You could feel that there was venom in uh, in their, their beats, in the way that they were constructing these songs. You could tell they were trying to speed it up, but maybe they hadn't figured out the blast beat entirely. And more importantly, these were tuneful, memorable pieces, which had a lot of the, uh, the idiosyncratic personality that Rotting Christ became known for early on. And I think this, for a lot of people, this was the first sort of official release where we got a taste of like what, when you're delving into the Greek black metal sound, this is the early thing that's going to let you know what it was. And we could look to their first album for a more clear idea of it. And uh, I feel like if we go any earlier and we go any further back in history, we touch upon a record like One Step Beyond Dreams, which was more black metal than their earlier demo tape on Verithron's uh, side of the spectrum. But it is still very much thrash metal in its construction and sound. And uh, we could accuse Rotting Christ of having quite a lot of thrash in their interest as well throughout their career. So this was just kind of a big release for its 
you know, in in uh, in hindsight, and it has some of my favorite songs by the band. Uh, I named the label that I started after one of these songs. So there's a lot of um, personal investment in this record, and it, it was one of those records that got me into black metal. It was being interested in uh, death metal demo tapes and obscurities, and uh, running into Rotting Christ history uh, was. Uh, accessible to me at the time and so that's part of my interest here but also the this is going to be an important band for some time in terms of uh, deciding what is melodic decidedly melodic and what is just black metal just a also just just a great record overall for my taste So we, we, you know, we could go down a couple of different routes when we talk about Into Infinite Obscurity from Dissection. Um, this was the first serious and most official release from Dissection at that point. It was a 7-inch. I think they'd even talked about it in zines before they'd recorded it. They were, uh, you know, a summer older and a little bit wiser. And there was just a lot of work that obviously went into getting from point A to point B. Part of that was getting a second guitarist, and part of that was just um, writing songs and really focusing on incorporating melody into death metal. Now, so the first demo from At The Gates is pretty sophisticated, but it is not melodic in the way that this is, and almost nothing is melodic in the way that this was before it happened. Now, I, I don't intend any revisionism here. I know that there were melodic works happening in extreme metal, but nothing like this. And I think that this is where we have to make a choice if this is more important to death metal, melodic death metal, or uh, melodic black metal. And really, there's no distinction to be made there. This is important to melodic black metal and melodic death metal as a a formative archetype for the way that songs are constructed. A lot of guitar techniques were fastidiously studied from this record, and you can tell it had broad-reaching uh, influence, uh, just as every release, and release from Dissection from this point had enormous impact and influence on uh, anyone around them, as well as the far-reaching corners of the earth. Um, I think that this is going to be our first official sort of like this is certainly a melodic black metal relic and an important one prepares us for the even more sophisticated leap into their uh, next two demos and uh, finally their full-length album in a lot of ways this was a great leap for the art form and um, we don't always see dissection as the uh, the keystone we don't always see infinite into infinite obscurity taken as the, the the important release for forming you know what melodic black metal is and it continues to be for good reason you know but as uh there's so much to get from this short collection of two songs and an, uh, an acoustic uh interlude that uh it really is worth studying closely what this seven inch does and just how important it was for a lot of people and um, just how different this result was from anyway. I'm just kind of rambling because I don't really have a detailed history of this release uh, beyond uh, the way that it appears in hindsight. Um, I think that I would, you know, you'd have to delve through years worth of retrospective interviews, which are not always informative, and uh, go back through zine interviews at the time, which are often very flippant and uh, uh, sometimes give a lot of credit I don't want to oversell the importance of this over what's to come next, but that sort of ends the, the sort of first chapter of our exploration into death metal and how that evolved into black metal traits. If I was more of a student of theory, I could probably tell you a little bit more about the, the implications of the guitar arrangements here. And uh, I, I would say that this is still shotgunned and blasting in a way that if you're a fan of the early grotesque sound, you know, there's still remnants of those uh, early Swedish death metal uh, adaptations from early Morbid Angel and things like that. But uh, this is sort of like the peak of our interest to start. And in part two, we'll step right into 1992, where we're still in a gray area. We're still going to be talking about death metal, but we'll see some of these actors really begin to stand out. 
and we'll see some new personalities uh, taking a stab at it and seeing what they can come up with. So that'll be interesting enough. Go ahead and go read through uh, this, this first part and uh, let me know if you have any additions you'd like to make, any addendums I could write in, or if you were involved with any of these, um, in the creation of any of these records, tell me all about it. I'd love to either do interviews or uh, written or otherwise that would um, give us a sense of the atmosphere when people began to define melodic black metal, melodic death metal, black metal, death metal, and how these things kind of became up you know, worked up to this point of sophistication on this release and we can go from there <laughs> 